Good evening, everyone. I'm going to check with our, our nice technician at the back. You said left, and then we thought stage left, and we got really confused. So we've in, this is how we've... No? We're good? <laughs> So, we can, shall we stay where we are? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this event this evening. My name is Alex Clark. This, of course, is Lauren Groff. Who, Lauren, you, you've got here through extreme circumstances, weather-related, have you not? I have. D'abord, j'aimerais bien dire, euh, je suis tout à fait ravie d'être ici avec vous, parmi vous, mais je ne vais pas parler français ce soir. Je vais parler anglais. Okay. Pour moi. Pour, pour toi. Oh, oui, good. No. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yes, so uh, my travel today was ridiculous. We had to run through everything. We took the wrong train. It was so hard. It was not Swiss travel the way that I thought. Swiss you went travel. back and forth a few times. Uh, yeah. You saw very much of uh, Lake Geneva. We saw the entirety of Lake Geneva. It was magnificent. More than once. Yes, in the rain. There was a rainbow. Uh, it was really <laughs> spectacular. So thank you so much yeah. for persevering <laughs> and getting here. But the reason I kind of bring this up is that Matrix, the book that we're going to be talking about this evening, primarily, although I think we probably will diversify, is kind of about resilience oh. in the face of what I believe is one of the themes of this conference, uncertainty. You had a lot of uncertainty today, but you were resilient. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, we're here, right? And this is a dream. And it's smiling. magnificent. And we're smiling and we're amongst arts and there will be food later and a cocktail, which I will drink really fast. Um, but, and Maza was with me. So like, I could not have been happier. It's really, it, everything is great. Resilience is really just forgetting quickly all of the troubles that you just went through. When I first saw Lauren this evening and she was rushing into the, the hotel, I actually thought for a minute that she maybe had just arrived from the States, but you're actually, you're, you're in Europe, aren't you, for a, yes. for a while at the yeah. minute? You, you've been living here for a little while. Yeah, I'm at uh, Berlin for six months. Uh, I'm living at the American Academy on Lake Wannsee, where terrible things happened. Um, but it's, it's really spectacular to be in Europe and away from the madness of the United States. Right well, now, so. and yet another thing we're going to talk about, oh, really, oh, the, uh, the idea of leadership <laughs> and power mm. and the abuses of power. Mm. Um, but I was thinking about resilience and uncertainty and power and all of these things mm. uh, when I was thinking about Matrix, which is the most extraordinary story. It is, Lauren, your fourth novel. Yes. And we may even talk about the fifth a little Ooh. bit later on. Okay. Um, by the way, we'll be coming to you for questions as well, mm -hmm. so be thinking of a good question. Um, it's your fourth novel. You have written historically before, mm -hmm. but I guess this is the most sort of full-throated immersion mm -hmm. into another time period, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's set in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. And it focuses on one particular character with another character in the wings, Marie de France mm -hmm. and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, just tell us a bit about those two characters for sure. people who don't know everything about them right. and why you decided to write about them. What attracted you to them? Yeah, so Marie de France, who's the sort of the center of my book, is a totally invented character in this book, primarily because we actually don't know mm. much about who she was as a person. So in life, in actual reality, she was the first published female poet in the French language. And she wrote um, a bunch of things, but my, my favorite is her Lay, which is a series of Breton um, it's basically short stories and poetic form that are just wild and, and exciting. Um, they're, they're courtly romances. There's also a queer werewolf. There's also um, a, a story about a, a, an enchanted boat, right? So there are these very ancient stories that she's retold into the vernacular. And the only things we know about her is that she is um, from France, right? Her, Marie, and her name is Marie. So it's a woman named Marie from France. Because and, she said, right. I am Marie I am from France. Marie that, this is one of the things France. that we know she wrote. That's it, right? That's it. And she keeps, um, she, she sort of brings herself up as Marie de France over and over again um, over the course of her, her works. Um, so the beautiful thing is, 
when you know nothing about a historical figure because she wasn't deemed important enough to write the details of her life into the historical record, uh, I guess the only thing I had to write about were the things that she had herself written about. Which, um, you know, I would hate it if anyone were to do that about me and my work, but that's all I had. So I could just <laughs> extrapolate her life from her work in some ways. Uh, and then on the other hand, the other person that you were referring to, I believe, is um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, or Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, who is my favorite figure in history, period. She was amazing. Right? She, was, um, she was born wealthy. She was born a noble. But she also was a two-time queen. Right? She was queen of France. And she, was, she hopped the channel and became the queen of the English. She raised up a brood of sons who threatened their father on the throne. I mean, she was the, the master eagle sort of raising her eaglets um, to go try to like take down their father. Uh, she was this, she's a brilliant politician, um, an incredible um, center of art and, um, and courtly life. And I just thought she was just a fascinating figure mm. whom we do know a great deal about. Mm. And actually she, she um, really embodied feminine, the feminine ideal in a way that um, she's basically representative of the feminine ideal of the time. So I found her really interesting in comparison to Mai Mui, who is this person who stands between genders. Right? She, she stands in her own world that she constructs herself. And completely beyond any idea of the feminine, of female beauty, yeah. either then or now or whenever. She is pictured immediately as someone almost grotesque looking. Well, I mean, she, I think she believes herself to be grotesque mm. looking, but I mean, she is told over and over again by people like Eleanor that she's not dainty, right? She's not pretty. Um, she's too rough. She has rough manners. She's large. She's well, large, she? right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And she likes to do things that are not feminine, right? She mm. likes to dispute with the, the scholars. She likes to sword fight. Right? She, she's just sort of a, she's a tomboy. And I was a tomboy. And I, well, I, I you know, I, I would have probably died a little bit if I wasn't a allowed to run around the woods all summer and to, to fight trees with my swords, uh, stick swords, yeah. What's so interesting is that Eleanor, as you say, is a character that you felt so much for, you had so much mm -hmm. interest in, mm -hmm. but you actually, she hovers over this book. Mm -hmm. She's rarely actually in it. Mm -hmm. You're going to read a little bit now oh, well, yeah. where the two characters do meet, but yeah. this is... This is a, an exception in the book, isn't it? This is a book where we're with Marie all the time, but we really know Eleanor through reportage, and this is just one of the rare moments when they meet. Yeah, should I talk about that first? Mm, just, okay. just set just, the scene. Just read, mm. just read, okay. No, no, just, okay. set the set scene, the scene. Of, <laughs> of how they, because as okay. the book opens, yes. essentially Marie has been banished by mm. Eleanor, mm -hmm. and this is their meeting some years later. Why has she been banished? Okay, so Eleanor, of course, by now is a, the queen of the English. Um, she's had a few children, um, and this this woman, this relative of her husband's, comes into the court, and she's just rude and weird, and nobody really likes her, and um, they can't marry her off, even though she's you know somewhat close to the crown because she's just so embarrassing, right? She's just an embarrassing person. So, but. Marie has skills. She's intelligent. She's uh, literate. She's numerate. She's, um, she has been able to run an estate, which uh, was something that women did a lot because the men were off fighting. And so the women had to be raised to, to be able to run these huge estates. And so Marie was able to do this. Um, so she's useful to Eleanor. So Eleanor decides to send her off to this uh, nunnery, this, this abbey um, that's basically dying, right? There's a, a COVID-like flu <laughs> pandemic happening. Um, and uh, the abbess in charge is letting the nuns starve because she does, she's too lazy to go get the rents, and right? it's really bad. So Marie is sent out of England to this place that's just 
awful. Um, and she has to decide whether or not she's going to make, make it into the place that becomes somewhat of a female utopia, mm. uh, right, a, a world of women, or whether she's just, or she's going to try to write her lay to get back to the court, or she's just gonna give up and die. Mm. Um, and then she obviously chooses two out of the three, and only one is successful. <laughs> <laughs> and then many years later, many years later, many years yes. later suddenly Eleanor appears. Yes. Yeah. Um, at the at the Abbey. Right. I do have to say too, this this book is predicated on the idea of courtly romance. And in courtly romance there's always an impossible love, right? There's a love at the center that is it is love because it's unattainable, right? It's love because it's sort of idealized and at the center of, of um, the usually, actually almost always ma men <laughs> who sort of look up to this, this paragon of beauty and virtue. Um, and for Marie, that paragon of beauty and virtue was always Eleanor, right? She was always the center of the courtly love. So, right, so Marie has been an abbess for a while. Eleanor is Eleanor. And here they are at the abbey that Marie has started to grow. Without preamble, Eleanor says, well, it has been decades and hasn't Marie become a great mountain of a woman? She tells her to sit if sitting doesn't break her chair, that is. No longer a gallows bird is Marie. She who had once been frightfully bony, my oh my. Marie smiles. The queen looks at her. She says in an amusing voice that no, perhaps these decades Marie has become a sphinx. Marie says that they do eat well now at the Abbey, that this place is not the starving place it had been when she arrived as a girl that Eleanor herself threw away. Those weeks when Marie watched little baby oblates go blue and waste away of their hunger. They do eat well and plentifully, though, of course, none of the nuns are fat. Nearly all of the nuns have tremendous muscles. Perhaps the queen is simply just unused to female strength. Or perhaps it has been so long since Eleanor's lady's army that she has forgotten. Perhaps any woman who is not so frail she would shatter with a shout would seem fat, at least to one so refined and courtly as the queen. It is, though, it is as though the queen cannot hear her. She says in an amusing voice that it's not as though Marie was ever small, is it? Her bones had simply been unfleshed all those years ago. Now she carries her own armor under her habit. Yes, she would say Marie has become a great old minoceros. Hide of iron, single vicious horn, or so she hears. Monoceros, yes, this is exact. Marie breathes through her nose and says she hopes the queen accepts Marie's condolences that she has been so recently made a widow. A bloody ulcer is such a painful thing. Marie found it curious that nobody wrote to tell her that she had to discover the news as though she were not blood kin. kin. Although, of course, Marie is only a half-sibling and a bastard. Surely the queen had been too busy to write Marie, her sister. Half-sister and only by marriage, Eleanor says sternly. Yes, in fact, she's always busy. But that it also has felt wrong to accept the condolences when she was not in the least sorry for her loss. There'd been real love there. Marie knows this. She saw it herself when she was a girl at court. Great love even once. Well, to be frank, the duties of the bedchamber of Angleterre were never the least onerous. And the queen laughs her breathless, quick laugh. But then Eleanor says that, but of course, if you put an eagle in the cage for more than a decade, she will try to pick your eyes out when you open the gate. Marie says that, well, things have worked out and the queen has been released from her long captivity and now her best eaglet perches on the throne of Angleterre. Those years of prison are redeemed. Though they did say some of the queen's captors had been quite cruel during her captivity, they took her gyre falcons from her. They kept her so starved of warmth, she had chillblains on her beautiful face. Marie often thought of the queen in her captivity, especially since there were times she was so nearby and the abbey with its comforts could have soothed her torment. In fact, the queen might have been far better here as a nun than as a caged queen. Eleanor blinks many times swiftly and Marie, Marie laughs inside. Swift blinking has always been a window into the woman's mind. Then the queen says, it is odd that Marie had thought of her often that she must confess she hardly thought of Marie at all. Or if she did, it was of a Marie when she knew her, fresh to court and so strange, all elbows and head knocking the doorway, and big, deep voice trying to engage in disputations, stinking and uncouth, and but all the world fleeing before her st stomping footsteps. What a poor specimen Marie was then. 
Before the girl had arrived, the plan had been to marry Marie off, but then in she flapped with her queerness, her panting eagerness, her unlovely face. And one could not marry off such a creature at all. The queen adds that should she retire to an abbey, it will be the great Fontevraud, not this paltry, muddy place on this hated island. The food has come. Marie gestures for the queen to sit. Things have grown too heated, and to cool the atmosphere, Marie says in conciliation that she had made for Eleanor a copy of her fables. The abbey's illustrator is mad and sees devils in the grasses and evil exhaled out of hot onion soup, but her work is very fine indeed. Marie wrote the stories during a blue streak while Abbess Emma was in her decline, and she stayed up in the nights in vigil over the old woman as she suffered. She had tried for a new kind of style in the fables, distant from the style of her lay. She is no longer writing of terrible, biting love. After these more than 30 years, she feels only love for her sisters in her heart. And her style must change to reflect this truth, of course, as well. In any event, she goes on, there's a story in the book about a crane and a wolf. Does the queen know the story? No. A wolf chewing a bone gets a cot in its throat. In pain, the beast calls all the animals of the kingdom together to, to demand that one pull the bone from its throat. Only the crane has a long enough neck. Of course, the crane is understandably reluctant to put its head between all those sharp teeth. At last, the wolf tells the crane that if it were to reach its head into the wolf's mouth, it would get a wondrous treasure. So the brave crane reaches in and plucks out the bone. The wolf, released from pain, tells the bird that it now will get its treasure. And that treasure is its life. The crane must be happy to not be eaten. The queen laughs and says, delightful. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you remember this, but mm -hmm. we, when your book first came out, we did an event at a, a of festival. Of course I remember this. This is Edinburgh. We were, going to, we were going to be in conversation with another writer, yes. Sarah Hall, who wasn't able to come because it was the middle of the pandemic. And I remember being so struck that there was a story in her book which is about an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and the artist had made a sculpture of the wolf and the crane. Yeah. And there your two books were, side by side. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it is about that particular story that oh. is so... Resonant. What do you think? It, I don't know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well you wrote no, it. No, you please. Um, <laughs> I guess it was in thinking about the two stories that I first came across this, this fable mm -hmm. in. It was about this idea of a sort of antagonistic cooperation, about mm -hmm. the idea of something that is cornered mm -hmm. and must accept its fate. Mm -hmm. And this, in a way, is Marie. Marie, when we first meet her... Mm -hmm. One of the things that defines her, apart from her unfeminity and her queerness and her, her oddness, is also that she's illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And this is used as a reason to exclude her from everything, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, and in a way, I suppose the book is about you showing how she uses all these things mm -hmm. to become more powerful. Is that how it feels to you? Oh, yes, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it's... it's I mean, I, my purpose in writing this book from the beginning, and purposes get changed all the time mm -hmm. as one writes, right? You sit down to, to write something, and five years later, you come up with something completely different that you had no idea was mm -hmm. in you. Um, but starting, I wanted to write about power in a person who doesn't have any really at all. And Marie doesn't. She's female. She's poor. Um, she's a bastard, right? And those lines of family are just not there for her, even though she, it's the one thing she may actually have, but she doesn't have them at all. And yet she's wildly intelligent, right? And she's able to sort of build something out of nothing. Um, so that's, that's part of it. And, and then I wanted to think about um, how power does manifest in, um, in, a, in a person like this, because uh, as, when I started this book, it was 2019, and um, we were coming out of the age of Trump. Um, and dear God, let us not go back into it. Um, but we were, we were sort of emerging from this tsunami of dread. 
and and I was and I had been thinking about um, the differences in a Hillary, you know, um, realm, <laughs> as opposed to in this in the world that we actually were given by this immensely privileged, um, frankly, very stupid man. Um, and and you know how maybe if Hillary had become president, if, if the power itself might have changed her, deformed her in a certain way too. Mm. So, so that's one of the, the initial sparks that threw the whole book into to blaze. Yeah. So it was a deliberate um, act, obviously, not to write a contemporary novel. You wanted to explore power. You had been thinking about it and the corruption of power. Mm. What does it offer you to do to set something in a completely other time and another place mm -hmm. entirely? What are the opportunities that that gives you? Right. So for a long time, I have to admit to this, I was a big snob, and I thought historical fiction was not great. And there was a, <laughs> I, there's a reason for this. And this is, I mean, Hilary Mantel is the best, right? And it has nothing to do with her. I think it had to do with coming up through the American MFA system, which does scorn, I think, historical fiction in a very real way, and in a, in a way that has been legitimized by people like Henry James, for instance, who absolutely hated historical fiction. And I think the snobbery is filtered through, um, mm. I guess, the roots of, of fiction writing. It is also true that uh, a lot of the books that are held in um, less esteem by the very highbrow critics are the ones where, you know, Fabio's um, opening his shirt on the cover and someone's in like a, a tartan skirt, right? It, it's, it's historical fiction as sort of lusty like romance fiction, right? I mean Bodice Ripper. Bodice Rippers. Yeah. Bodice Rippers had been for a long time sort of the, the preeminent form of historical fiction. Mm. So I had a lot of snobbery about this. Um, and I thought I would never, I actually said aloud, I think probably 12 years ago, I will never write a novel that's historical fiction, and here I go. Um, I think and there I, was historical fiction, though, in The Monsters of Templeton. Yeah, I mean, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there, I was, mean, there was a kind of like mashup a, of genre. I know, you're totally in, right, in, I know. In that. And I think I probably hated myself for that at the time. <laughs> but wait, but this is, a, this is a transformation story because I no longer feel this way. Um, so, so I actually, uh, I came all the way around because there's no such thing as a historical fiction, mm. right? All fiction is based in the time that it's being written. Even, even if the, the writer is writing about the future, it's based from this moment, mm. right? Even, even if the writer is writing about the past, it's sort of, the, the, it's the current moment that's giving the, the work itself its, its urgency. Every book, whether it's done in the contemporary day or not, is actually a time traveler, right? Because what it's doing is it's writing of the present into the future, into the future reader, right? Who will read this, this work and this work of the past because when the book has been written, it's already the past, right? So, mm -hmm. so every book is a time traveler. Every book is, a, is historical in a certain way. And then I thought of all of the books that I love the most, right? War and Peace is historical fiction, right? Um, Middlemarch is historical fiction. Absalom Absalom is historical fiction. So why should I sh sh like hate these beautiful works of fiction? And not only that, they're all completely different from one another. Right. So it's it's yes. a, it, it's a genre that can be as wide as it's there are as many so books. So why? I, I wonder yeah. if one of the issues though is that people fear, and indeed it can happen. Mm -hmm. A pastiche, yes. that it can become yes. a, a, something so arch and constructed that it's just rather kind of pointless in the end. And it's That's a, the criticism, yes. perhaps. Pastiche, but also tourism in time, right? It, mm. it can feel a bit um, conservative, right? So why engage with the urgencies of the moment if you're just going to like look backwards, right? And looking backwards um, can feel very conservative, right? It's, it's sort of like mm. it, it, um, enthroning the past to the detriment of the present. But at the same, so I thought, well, no, I mean, historical fiction can be an incredibly powerful 
tool to critique the present, actually. So if you were to write it in a way where the past and the present are in constant conversation, right? It's like you're hitting a tuning fork and you're hearing both like sounds. The singing is happening between these two, two time periods. Mm. Um, so that's what I wanted to do with this book. And actually, um, it was very overt that a lot of the concerns in the book are concerns that are the most urgent for me at the uh, now. Yes. Right? And yes. I did it. I chose this time only, really, because I did not want to talk about like a bloviating orange circus peanut, right? I didn't want to talk about um, cell phones, which are the most boring things, right? I didn't want to talk about computer games or things that I find just like mind-numbingly dull and boring. Um, so why not like to take the past and sort of and make it sing into the present moment? Why not? One of the interesting things that, that you do is you've obviously, as, as you've said, you've got this character about whom very little is known on the historical record. We, we think we do know that she probably did live in England yes. for a great part of her life. We think. And she has been connected mm -hmm. to a, a religious order, but we don't actually know that that's, right. that's what she... So, so there you have this person, you could do whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. But it seemed to me also, reading the book, that, that there is a register in it that is very unrealistic, deliberate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's heightened. Yes. Anyway, you're not actually suggesting that even this imagined no. life mm -mm. could actually happen. There are all sorts of different kind of elements, and as I say, registers mm -hmm. in it. She gains immense power, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and it becomes a book about about that. It's almost mm -hmm. fantasy in a way. Is well, that how it felt writing it? Yeah, I mean, yes. And that's very deliberate. It's because when you read a lot of the texts of that time period, right, um, chivalric romances, right, and, and um, other poems and things at that, that time, um, it's, realism isn't the same thing as it is now, mm. right? Realism is kind of shiftier a little bit. And if you start to try to put yourself into the mindset of someone from the 12th century, this is a time where there are no newspapers, right? There, um, People generally, unless you were very, very wealthy, you stayed close to home. Um, you knew the same people your entire mm. life. You got news through song. Um, and through hearsay, right? There's uh, facts were a little bit different, and there was a lot of belief in things that today we would think are superstitious. Not only medicinally, right? There are medicinal things that were um, we would see as just quackery, completely insane, um, but also just just daily living, right? Um, if you spat into a fire, that made the fire live and, and grow, right? That's tiny, but I mean, it's sort of a, a, a something that we would call superstitious now. We already had a different timber to it, had a different taste to it. And so what I really wanted to do was to make this, this time sort of sing, like feel a little bit as though it had this, this kind of porous reality, a sort of, a, a, sort of a, a, a time that's a little bit shifty, a little less um, of what we think of as truthful, straightforward, mm, mm you know, as if it were written in a histor history I think book. that's why it's so powerful, actually, and so okay. transporting. I guess also thinking about representation mm. at this period in history is completely different. It's flat, it's not dimensional, it's, it's dramatic, yes. right. too, right? right? Oh, so one of the, my favorite things was actually looking at the art of the time, right? Because perspective was kind of, it wasn't here, right? It didn't really exist. And um, there's this amazing image on the seal of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, uh, no, 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 Hildegard von Bingen. Sorry, she was another person who's very deeply in this book. I love Hildegard. She is the best. Um, she is this uh, abbess and mystic and um, medicine maker. And she's a musician whose music we still play now. She's, she's like a polymath genius. And I loved her so much. Um, so Hildegard is here. And there's this image of Hildegard um, where she's probably like 30 feet tall. And she's surrounded by her nuns that are all at waist level. Um, and this was a way of showing that she was a great woman, right? She was a great woman amongst regular people. And so in some ways, Marie's 
like largeness actually comes a little bit out of that image of Hildegard, right? Yeah, and so, so my research and my, my, my understanding of the, the weird like shifts in perspective, the way that faces are so large, right? And the, <laughs> and the bodies are so little in the drawings people made. Um, the sense of humor that people had at the time was just bonkers. It was so funny. Um, there are these things called drolleries, and in some of the manuscripts of the day, um, bored scribes or just people who hated the priests over them um, would draw, make little cartoons, little drawings. And some of them are hilarious. They're so funny. There's one where there's a, um, a uh, I think it's a rabbit. Rabbits were sort of an indicator of uh, someone without a whole lot of uh, power, right? So mm -hmm. rabbits are weak, mm -hmm. rabbits are eaten. Um, rabbits get chased by everything, dogs, every, everything eats them. So rabbits became sort of an illustrator of just the common man, right? Or, or maybe even just the common priest or something. Um, and there are these images of jousting rabbits, one of them sitting on like a snail with a, like an old priest's head, and the other one sitting on s some turtle or something. There's, um, there's this amazing image of a, um, a nun plucking penises from a penis tree. So like they're really weird and kind of Scatological and, and um, that doesn't correspond to our very flat modern perception of what the Middle Ages were. Right? Mm. Short, um, brutal, um, sad, very cold, muddy, right? I mean, that's sort of what our perception of the Middle Ages. There is staying. a lot of mud, though, in the book. There's a lot of mud in the book, and there was Come a lot on. of mud. But, <laughs> but people washed themselves, for instance. They actually they took care to wash themselves. They weren't all stinky. Although you do have that bit very early on in the book when she arrives at the... the um, and, and very unhappy, Ooh, deeply yes. unhappy. Yes. Marie arrives at the Abbey, and is told that she must have a bath. Mm -hmm. And she says, no, I bathed in November. Yeah. And I, I actually felt that was, a, you were clearly being humorous. I mean, you know, you were looking at us then. And I was, like, yeah. Oh God, what? And they said, no, it is an absolute sin to be dirty. You must bathe once a month. Well, they bathe they, like to here and here, right? Like that's not bathe. really bathing, is it? But I mean, it just brings me on to the, the incredible, I mean, I do think there's this sense of, of heightened reality and unreality mm. to various yeah. aspects of the book that we'll come on to. But... There is also this great thinginess of it. There is Thingy. a great sort of quotidianness to it as well. Not least because you are describing women at work. It's a community of women. Mm. They're working actually terribly badly mm -hmm. at the beginning. Like, mm. like nothing is thriving, mm -hmm. including them. They're all starving. Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just terrible. Mm -hmm. And Marie kind of, we don't even really know quite how she does it. She just seems to slip herself in mm -hmm. to a sort of position of power and revolutionises this whole thing, suddenly everything's brilliant. You write about the world of work with amazing care and attention. Did it fascinate you? Yeah, well, yes. Um, I was absolutely in love with the, the, the daily cycle of what an abbey would have gone through at the time, right? Mm. So there are these very clear demarcations between prayer and work. And work is prayer, but you would stop and you would actually go to pray many times a day and in the night as well. Um, and I, th I started to think about how there were no clocks, right? Um, there was no way of telling time, except if you actually paid a great deal of attention to the world around you, to what's happening to the sun in the sky, where the sun is, um, what's happening to the flowers, like you know exactly when they come up and when they go back down. Um, so it, it occurred to me that I don't know how it is to be a medieval person, and I will never know how it is to be a medieval person, right? because I was um, rotted, corrupted from the beginning by the contemporary world. But I do know what it is to be an animal, right? because we are all animals, believe it or not, even though we pretend not to be. Um, and we understand the world through our bodies first, right? And mm -hmm. so, so I do know what it's like to, to hold a warm bowl in which there's food, right? I can feel that. I have felt that. Um, and I don't think it's much different from a warm bowl holding warm food would have been uh, a thousand years ago. So that's a similarity, and that is a similarity that's happening through the animal body. And so 
there's a thinginess in this book because this is the way that I understood how to get into the time and into the people and into the, the actual sensory feeling of being in this book. It's understanding that um, we are, we're not intellectuals first. I, I think most of us are not. There are people like that. Um, so boring to talk to you um, <laughs> at cocktail parties. Um, but we are animals, right? Well, we're, we're emitting pheromones, right? Um, the f first like a millisecond that you meet someone, you decide if you're going mm. to like that person based on clues that are absolutely invisible to you at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's based on um, your, your past and your body and the way that your body feels with this other person, right? If you're feeling threatened, if you're feeling um, attracted, whatever it is. Um, so I, I like to think of each scene or each moment that I'm writing this book, each time I'm sort of hitting something, I'm trying to find the sensory, trying to find the sensory first. And from the sensory, there comes the intellectual, the emotional, all of those other things. I think this is why those, those kind of details of the physical, like, for example, uh, you know, the fact that they can't at first get clogs for Marie because her feet are so big, so half her feet are hanging off in the mud and freezing to death and all this kind of thing. Um, and then those details about, you know, her apricot trees mm. blooming and this is how we understand it. It goes in another direction to that physicality of the book mm. and into her sexual mm. and erotic life. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about that aspect of the book. She is in love with Eleanor. Mm -hmm. um, that is the, you know, the great sort of unattainable love that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. She has other loves too. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of, I suppose you could call it, you know, the queering of Marie de France. Uh, I don't know if that's a term that you'd agree with. Uh -huh. How did that come about? Why did you want to write about it in that way? So, um Everything that I know about this character came out of a, a thought experiment I did at the beginning of this book, which was I took um, the work that I feel fairly sure Marie de France actually wrote, and I sat down with a piece of paper, and I took every moment that sort of pulsed with sort of incredible vitality or strangeness, or I felt sort of the soul of the actual writer in this. And I put the, each moment into this text and sort of built a little um, very short story out of it. It was about this big. Um, and out of this text, I got this, this person. And this person was big, as we've discussed. She's overwhelming. She sort of um, she, she doesn't have boundaries. She sort of overwhelms all boundaries. And she's She's an animal so thoroughly first, right? So the, the, the person who wrote the poems of Marie de France was hyper attentive to textures, um, to smells, to, to beauty, um, visual beauty, auditory beauty. It's just it, like her attention to uh, the aesthetic pleasures of the world was so intense to me mm. that I saw in this sort of condensation of it that I thought, Okay, this character is someone who is hungry and just she cannot be contained. Um, and her, her hunger is hunger in every direction, right? So this is a person who would have found a way to have sex if there was one other person in the world, right? Like, just because she lives so deeply in her body. So it's not that I think that she's queer. I just think that she wants so badly through her body, right? She's mm. so mm. hungry. Um, and she and she's she's just in love with the world, um, and she will try anything. <laughs> so, like, so yes, she she does in this book, and I know like this is something people yell at me about. She does have sex with women. She would she would have found a way um, to have sex anywhere. I think this this character. No. But she also is in love with women. She's in too. love, yeah. I mean, she's, she she's likes in falling in love. She loves falling in love, yeah. Right, yeah. She's, she's hungry. The, she's it, a hungry it's, person. It's the very, I mean, when we're considering, considering the idea of the utopia, <clears throat> what's interesting to me particularly about the book is that it, it, it you know, as I've said, she revolutionizes this, I mean, she builds it into something that becomes almost fantastical. Mm -hmm. It's just su such power mm -hmm. accrues to it and to her. I feel as a reader that we are being invited to consider whether that is a good or a bad thing, mm -hmm. whether she is a tyrant or mm -hmm. 
benevolent, mm -hmm. wonderful utopia builder. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like you are really telling us what to think in either direction. Mm. I don't know perhaps if even you have made up your mind. No. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, I know what I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, no, I do think um, this is not a hagiography and it was never meant to be. And um, that one reviewer who said it was, she just doesn't know what she's thinking. Um, but uh, this was meant to be questioning female power, right? What is it and how, how would it be different? So my, I grew up in a family, my father is this beautiful human, um, but he is a person of a certain time and when I was a kid, he, he you know, to, to be a feminist, to, to sort of display his feminist credentials, he would say, you know, if only women ruled the world, we would be, we would be so much better off, you know, we would. Uh, and for a long time, I believed that also, right? I mean, it is, it's a very romantic vision of the world and women. But women are human, right? We are full of ambivalence. Uh, we are full of ambition and hunger and vice and sin. And uh, it's not that we're no better than men. We just haven't sh gotten a chance to show how we are no better than men. <laughs> so, so I actually think, um, I guess in some ways, I wanted to muddy the waters a little bit to say, OK, here's female power. But I wonder if it'll happen the way that I think it happens, which is when someone has almost absolute power, that power, um, and, and is spending most of their life pushing against uh, really tight institutions and structures that actually contain one, what maybe that power that you end up getting makes you start to impose those structures, the same structures, the same mm. institutions on the people that are ostensibly beneath you, right? So if there is a hierarchy, and the Catholic Church has always been hierarchical, right? There, there will be a certain point at which this sort of inward um, motion will also become this, sort of in a, a cage um, put around other people as well. And I do believe that that is what happens and would, have, would happen. Do you think there's, though, as you might you know, a, again, a reading of this book, there is a sort of tipping point because certainly lives for the people in this utopia get much, 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 much better right. under Marie, right? You know, they get, they are not dying of starvation mm -hmm. and sickness any longer. They're self-sufficient, they're wealthy. You see it as an economic uh, privilege too, as economic success is absolutely vital to her success mm -hmm. and self-sufficiency mm -hmm. and independence. What is the tipping point? What mm -hmm. tips someone over into what is essentially a sort of megalomania, a solipsism, I mm -hmm. suppose? Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unchecked growth, right? And, and that's what capitalism is. It's, it's growth, growth, growth to the um, exclusion of anything mm. else. Mm. And actually, Marie is very much a businesswoman. And she's mm. very much a capitalist. So. I don't know. Maybe that's my theory. I, I don't know what other okay. people would Okay, so it say, is yeah. a sort of system that she... And I'm, I'm just before we move on to... Well, we're going to get some questions, but I wanted to ask you also about some other of your work very briefly. Sure. But before we do that, the wonderful symbol in this book of what she decides to build, oh, yeah. which is something that both protects the Abbey, a series of sort of a labyrinth kind mm -hmm. of around it, and also insulates it, is also... a tremendous barrier. She almost at this point becomes a kind of war leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just tell me about, about dreaming that up, because that was the moment at which I thought the book felt really sort of speculative in a way. Oh, it was deeply. So that came out of a very early draft, and it actually came from something that has been haunting me since I've seen it. Um, in the early draft, there was much more overt conversation between the 21st century and the 12th century. There was just a lot of actual talking back and forth. And one of the things that happened was, um, so I'd seen in The Guardian, I want to say 10 years ago, there was a drought in England. And um, in these photos that taken from a drone, uh, you could see um, the, these like primordial, these atavistic structures, the forms of them 
coming up to almost touch the surface of the, the earth, even though they've been gone for 3,000 years. So old uh, pigsties, old houses, the shapes of them were so deeply pressed into the earth that now that the earth was going through a drought, um, the earth was remembering these things. Right? So they, they, these forms are coming up and sort of almost like physical ghosts haunting the, the, the surface of the earth. And I thought that that was so powerful, right? This mm. was such a powerful metaphor for this particular book. Um, and in the early drafts, I had this labyrinth, which was taken from a, uh, an apocryphal story about Henry II and his wife Eleanor and a mistress. So like, the, the story is Henry put his mistress into a labyrinth to keep her away from his wife, but Eleanor, being evil, found a way in to kill her. Um, but of course, this didn't actually happen. Um, but I took this idea of the labyrinth as, as uh, a space that is protective, but also it makes the, the people there very strange and isolated. Mm. Um, and, and then, you know, in the, in the early drafts, um, the labyrinth is gone, but you can sort of start to see sort of the ghosts impressing themselves upon the surface of the earth itself. So, uh, so that metaphor stayed in the book. Um, and became something very strange, right? And, and somewhat mm. speculative. Mm. But that's what happens when you write a book. The things that seem most powerful to you transform and become something completely different. Tell me about the next book oh. in which um, you've gone back to the past again, because you're now a historical novelist. You're not I guess I am. You're not I snobby am. about <laughs> it at all. You love it. You'll probably never write another contemporary oh, work. Yes, I will. I think you will. I think to. you will too. Right now. Uh, because <laughs> let's look at all your books. I mean, they're all pretty, yeah. again, pretty different from one they're another. Very different. But this is America. This is the 17th century. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So um, the first permanent English settlement in um, the, the North America, um, was uh, in Virginia. It was called Jamestown. And Jamestown was horrific for the first few years. I mean, I, I want to say, I, and this is not an exact quote, but I think it's 80% of the people who got there died. And they died of starvation and disease and murder and cannibalism and all sorts of really horrendous things that happened. You know, drinking salt water, which you should not do. Um, and it, like, just stupidity, too. I mean, there's a lot of um, laziness and stupidity as well. So there was this very strange time. And I was really, really interested in um, survival narratives. Um, I'm like a crazy like survivalist in my own brain uh, that doesn't manifest in like buying a lot of guns, but it does manifest in like learning how to make flour mm. and to spin your own wool. If I ever had a lamb, I, I would know how to spin wool from it. Um, but so, so I... Um, I was interested in these things, and I was interested in these, the first female form of writing in, in North America that um, was kept because the Native Americans, um, if they had writing, wasn't kept, is these captivity narratives. So it's these um, women from England um, or who were born in North America who were captured by Native Americans. And these were narratives that are hyper propagandistic, right? They were they were made in order to promote um, the the colonization of this place and these people. Um, but once in a while, you get a voice like the voice of Mary Rawlinson, where there's sheer actual um, human warmth and anguish actually both coming out of the text, sort of rising out of the text to the surface. So I thought, oh my gosh. Oh, wait, I, I also am deeply in love with Robinson Crusoe because I think it's one of the great <laughs> weird books about that sort of codifies an entire culture's ideals in mm. one place, right? It is, mm. it is England of the time, like everything. That's what mm. Robinson Crusoe is and does on his little island. So um, I thought, why not make, and uh, why not take um, captivity narratives, Robinson Crusoe, and gut them, take all the stuffing out, turn them inside out, and see if I can make something different that's not for propagandistic purposes, that sort of shows the, um, the really complicated uh, relationship and ambivalence of being a person without power back at that time who's both an um, agent of colonization and also in some ways um, 
unable to change anything right at the same time too. So this is this wild ro female Robinson Crusoe in North America um, who meets God. She meets God. Okay, so yeah. a, another unambitious, <laughs> yeah. quiet narrative. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's very forthcoming. Tell me what it's called again. Oh, The Vaster Wilds. The Vaster Wilds. Mm -hmm. And it's and out it's, in September. It's, it's out soon, yeah. so we yeah. can... Uh -huh. You'll be doing yeah. this again and yes, talking about that again. Shall we have some questions yes. from the audience? Now, we have microphones going around that we need you to uh, wait for so that we can get our translators to work. Who would like to start us off with a question? Thank you to the translator. Yes, I speak you really quickly. Much. I really apologize. Somebody just here in yeah. this row that you've just got to. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. You said at certain point of this conversation that for most we are animals and not human at the first uh, and, and not intellectuals. And Frankly speaking, what struck me the most when I start to read this book as someone whose English is not the first language is how sophisticated words you used. <laughs> Was it a conscious choice to, to make some impression or could you comment a bit on this? Thank you. Sure. So Every project that I do has its own lexicon and its own vocabulary because you know words are the most sophisticated, I think, tools that humans have. I believe this and I will always believe this and nobody could tell me any different. Um, but what happens is I get really wildly excited about the time periods that I'm writing about. I do way too much research. I, and I start to speak in the language that I'm, I'm, ta I'm speaking from then. So I metabolize these strange words, these strange ideas, and it actually becomes part of me. So when I sit down to tell this story, because it's part of um, my research and be, uh, what I'm doing, it becomes part of the, the text itself. So with the Faster Wilds, because it's 1609, that's the, the time of Shakespeare, right? So I went back and I reread all of Shakespeare, and I got so excited because he's so into neologisms, right? He's so into iambics. So for the first probably five drafts, I only wrote in iams all the way through. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, so. Did you know you were? I did. I was you so did. excited about it. Right. It was very exciting. It was a conscious thing, not that yes. it, you'd been sort of... Well, she's of... also running. So, mm. and, and that's, that is a really good rhythm for running, sure. right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so, but it's also, you know, it, it's really exciting to go back it, to, to Shakespeare and find these words that we've forgotten, right? That, that, that's just the source of absolute wealth and richness that is accessible to everyone. All you have to do is open up, I don't know, Timon of Athens, which is like the worst of his plays, and still be, <laughs> be subsumed in this like genius and, and able to, to, um, to hear um, the Elizabethan age through these words, right? So, uh, so it's, um, it's, it's sheer nerdiness, right? It's sheer being just in love with language. Um, and uh, Faster Wilds actually comes from a Shakespeare line, um, and it is about the vasty deeps. Um, and vasty, eh, nobody uses that. Um, and the deeps is about the ocean, but I can steal this line and use it. So it's a it's a borrowing and a it's sort of re a, 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 a refashioning. It's a, a twisting. twisting. Yeah. And in this yeah. book, you, the, the language, as you said earlier, was the language of the courtly romance. That yes. was what was right. was sort of feeding you in a way. Yes, the courtly romances. You. Um, and uh, let me, the, the mysticism, I mean, the, the mystics, medieval mystics had their own sets of symbology, like the symbolism was very rich and very deep. And um, I actually had to know a lot of it in order to, to write my own mystical visions. That it, A lot of them actually, uh, like, they all were something that someone sort of said, but not all in one place. Right, so I, I took um, the visions of about, I don't know, 15 different mystics and sort of compiled them into this sort of this weird feminist mystical idea of what the Catholic Church could have been. I just remembered another woman who's in the book, yeah. the Empress Matilda. Yeah, she I love also her. Met, so so oh, yeah. yet another, yeah. there are these extraordinary women in the book. Thank you so much. Let's yeah, have a, you. 
another question, if anybody would like to. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, while listening to your description of your book, what role does God play? I mean, we are in the Middle Ages, we're in a monastery, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, what notion of God does he figure in the book? Yeah, so um, God is not male in this book. Um, God is, uh, so there are no men at all in the book, at all. Um, it's your George Cukor. I know, it's my George <laughs> Cukor. So, right, so I love that you, so I don't know if you've seen this, but there's this incredible 1939, I believe, film called The Women. And The Women is just brilliant. It's, it's, it's George Cukor at his very best. Um, and the only characters in this, this film are women. But because it's from 1939, um, Every conversation the women have is about a man or men. And so it doesn't pass the Bechdel test. So there's this test that Alison Bechdel, the great graphic novelist, says, which is um, a work is really only feminist if there are um, more than, or two women talking about something other than men. Right. Um, so this book, so I saw this the night before I had this sort of like secular vision about the book. Um, and I was like, oh, this is terrible. So in the English version, um, even the animals are not um, male. They're all female, um, which could not happen in French. <laughs> like, it's just not possible. Um, but so God, in this book, um, Marie comes out of this place where, you know, she's, she's a Catholic, like, I think, possibly throughout time, there have been Catholics who uh, ha have the knowledge, have the tradition, and are halfway there, right? Like, they understand it. They're not deeply devout. Marie, by the time she goes to um, the abbey, she, she understands prayer, right? But she's, she's, she's not godly. Um, when she gets there, things start to shift for her over the period of many decades, right? She, she's an abbess for many decades, and she starts to believe in um, a different kind of church, a different kind of God, um, a God that is more feminine. And, uh, and she starts, and when she goes through menopause, and this is the borrowing from Hildegard von Bingen, when she goes through menopause, she starts to have mystical visions, which Hildegard did. And that's when God starts to talk to her. And for Marie, God is talking to her in these visions of um, sort of like a, just a, a different tweaking. Jesus, um, in a lot of representations throughout the Catholic um, faith has always been somewhat a little bit feminine, right? I mean, um, I was just in Italy, and in I can't remember which church it was. Jesus was sort of like holding open his wound, and of course the wound looked very feminine. Um, it was like very much a feminine body part. Um, so like th there have been times where, and, and the, like a pelican eating its own breast, right? Like that, that mm. is like a, 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 so there are these, these symbols and these visions of a feminization of the church, a feminization of God that have happened through history. And generally the Catholic church has like beaten them down. So I wanted to sort of make this an alternate, um, maybe a, a sacrilegious vision of what the church could be. I like your very generative view of menopause and I representation of yeah, menopause right? and fiction. You get visions. <laughs> See, that it's is much... the opposite of what we're told, which is with menopause, we sort of shrink into little, like, withered, like, stones. But that's not true. We have a different kind of power, right? It may not create babies, but it creates other things. Yeah. Let's have a, another question. Who, yes, there's a lady there. Thank you very much for this presentation. But the question I want to ask is, I'm very intrigued by your ability to draw us into your images to such an extent that you could almost dispense with words. So my question is, do you think in 3D? Do you write in 3D? I do. Thank you for asking. This is amazing. Nobody's ever asked me this question. So um, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's made me understand about the maze and the labyrinth and yeah, so in a different I, I way. I do. I'm a little bit of a synesthete, which it, I'm not like Nabokov. Like I don't see colors in the in the alphabet. Um, but uh, feelings have colors for me, right? And and colors have feelings as well. Um, and words, different words have different like emotional tones which correspond to the colors as well. But what I do, 
So um, this is a like a for anyone. Um, if if this helps you, I it would it would make me very happy. Um, but when I start to go into a scene, I um, I always have this one meditative thing that I do, which is I just shut everything down. I shut my eyes. I close my ears. I shut everything down, and I set a timer. And I slowly, very slowly over time, open up each sensory um, input. And I start to hear what they would hear in the scene, right? Very, very slowly. And things start coming out of the woodwork. A different, a bird that I know, right? Or, or the ocean sort of on the beach. And I'm listening very deeply to these things. And then I, I open up the smell, right? And I start to smell what's happening in the scene, right? And then I go through. Um, very slowly, all of the senses, until the last one is vision, because the vision is what I think most people tend to pay most attention to, to the detriment of the other senses. By the time the internal eyes are opened, I have so much information about what's happening in the scene, right? And so much emotional information, because we are so profoundly tied to where we are at any given moment emotionally, right? So you can have a scene that is the same exact scene done at the beach when most people are naked and there's like coconut oil happening um, and beautiful music happening. The same scene happening on top of a mountain when someone um, has lost their skis, right? Um, there's distress and cold and there's leisureliness and maybe slight irritation here. And the scene will be profoundly different because you're in different emotional states because you're having different um, sensory um, information happening at, the, at any given time. And so my, I do think in 3D, but my 3D is animal 3D, right? I become, I become an animal in terms of the body. I start, to, I start to understand things sort of through the body in a three-dimensional way. That's fascinating. When you say slowly, I mean, yeah. kind of how, to, like, I don't know, just writing a scene, for example. I mean, how slowly do you mean? Oh, like over the course of 15 minutes. I mean, it's, it's right. slow, yeah. But, but it is like a slightly meditative, Yeah, it's an exercise in It's a an way. exercise, yeah, and wow. it, I do it every day. Um, it doesn't always, uh, it's not always successful because with most meditation, you're sort of chasing puppies, right? <laughs> and you're trying to bring puppies back into the center. But what it does is it gives you information even if it's not super mm. successful, right? It can, it can um, the great Hilary Mantel, for instance, um, she had this one story where everyone works differently. She, um, she would put two chairs in front of her and sit in one chair and invite her characters to sit in the other chair. And they would sit down and she would just have a conversation with mm. them, right? And so that, that's a, it's a very similar exercise, but hers is about understanding the character there, like uh, deeply and trying to under, ask questions of the character and get the character to tell her who they are. Um, it's, it's tricks. But she did also say, and I realize we're mm. nearly out of time, but she did also say uh, that the process of bringing her works to stage mm completely sort of refreshed, renewed, refined her process, yeah. partly simply because of the business of getting them to move around. Mm -hmm. I wonder if those kind of, you know, reversals in a way, that all those renewals are really important when you're oh, going through a writing yes. career because, you know, The Vaster Worlds will be your fifth book. What, seventh book, but... Seventh book, I fifth mean, novel, I have two sorry. short story collections. Nobody yes. reads short stories. It's fine, I like them, but... Sorry. No, sorry, that's good. <laughs> Read Lauren's short story, <laughs> or she'll never come again. Yeah, um, but but looking for those new ways in and new ways of understanding is really important. Isn't yeah, it? no, you have to break yourself. I, I believe this deeply. Um, I have to break myself every single time I try a new um, a new project, and often it doesn't work for a really long time, and I'm very frustrated. And then one day it opens up. It starts to open up. Yeah. Lauren, thank you so oh, much you. for telling us such a... You're going to go and sign books in this foyer down here where I think there are also cocktails. Cocktails! I mean, you know, cocktails. We all deserve <laughs> it. You perhaps particularly, since you ran through Geneva several times. Uh, books are upstairs on sale. As you know, there are so many other wonderful uh, conversations and talks happening yes. this weekend. But what... What a wonderful opening night this oh, has thank been. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.